uh, of varietal in there. Are you looking at the 19? Is that the uh, Yeah, I believe we are. Let me make sure. Yeah, so there's actually no um, Viognier in the 19. Right. We, got oh, okay. hit, we got hit with a severe frost that year mm-hmm. and it wiped out that whole block. Um, and the Marsan Rusan, it's 50 50. Okay. Or is what, in, what impact has it had? Because it'll be quite an unusual example then of your of your VBR white. What 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 impact has it had in not having the Viognier as a context? Is it more of a question of phenolics? Well, I mean Viognier is pretty, you know, it's it's a recognizable variety. You always sure. get that apricot and you get richness with it. Right. So okay. if you did, if you did not deduct that from the blend, um, right. that's the impact. Okay. But in the nineteen, we went through quite a different uh, wine making change in the process. So we were trialing a lot of different things, and it wasn't really quite latching on. And okay. so we went with a different technique completely for the nineteen, and uh, it looks quite different from the previous vintages. But it did yield like the Halliday. It yielded 95. Yeah, yeah, and, exactly. and one, um, Tyson Stelzo, who's the Halliday editor now, put yeah. it as his best wine in Australia under 30 bucks. So, really, I didn't pick up on that award. That's fantastic. That's so, fantastic. He actually wrote us a lovely note about it, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Well, he picked up what I, I but essentially, they're varieties and a wine style that are really hard to get traction with. So I thought, well, let's just show some wine making flex and try mm. and make something that's quite flashy. And mm. we tried to emulate what a white bird would look like if you made it from these varieties. Yeah, so yeah, got it. It's full of flint and it's got a lovely sort of hazelnut, cashew oak. Um, it was full solids, uh, you know, really worked in some texture there. Um, whole bunch down, we pulled back all the skin contact that we had with the Viognier because there was none. Um, changed around our Coopers, uh, really trying to get that strut, uh, like strut match flint in there, yep. just to see if we could. And it turns out we could. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was just reading um, Gary Walsh's note on this. He speaks, he uses a phrase that I've never come across before and it's so right. He talks about snuffed candle wax. You know, I, I kind of, Delhi dally around, you know, with beeswax, and I, I never quite managed to get the words right. But for me, that really nails that particular component so well. Uh, I think it's very clever. Yeah, I got to, I got to say that I was just saying to die as I tried this. There's an overwhelming. Um, and I was going to ask Mark, so I'm glad you've clarified, Mark, that the struck match thing is really overwhelming in it at the moment. Does that blow off over time, or uh, it can be a little bit obtrusive? Yeah, it can definitely be obtrusive. Uh, see where you're coming through. What is more, rather than it will blow off with time, but what right. it will do it will increase its ageability. Okay. So, so it's, it's very hold. pronounced. It's very absolutely. pronounced at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. You, but you'll find it hold, holds its line extremely well. If you're putting a 19 white from another brosser up against this, this would yeah. look extremely fresh. So. Yeah. It's going to go a lot, long time this, but you're right. It is quite pronounced, and in the twenty, we've just pulled it back a little bit, so it's more more enjoyable in the short term. Oh, but again, you should line this up against uh, some five hundred dollar white burgundies. <laughs> I mean, if you are, <laughs> <laughs> but you see, you see, in um, especially uh, yeah, Burgundian white, um, that yeah. character is often very pronounced. I think I think the very first Marseille Roussin I ever had out of Oz would have been uh, Rick Kinsbrunner's ones from Gioconda, the Le Deux, I remember so well. And for me, it's just and obviously different to why cooler climate and made in a different way. But I fell in love with Marseille Roussin when I first tasted that bottle. It's something Didn't that Tarbuk wanted. used to do a lot of that stuff too? Mainly Marseille. I'm not sure Marseille. if Tarbuk ever blended. I've tasted some seriously old Marseille from them, but yeah. uh, they I, I certainly do. But they they do it in a they have an MVR. But for them, the famous one for them is Marsan, but it's made in that Hunter Semion style. Yeah, which is no oak, early pick, high sulfur, low phenolics, ages a really long time. Mm. Uh, costs very little, produce and buy, but that's quite a nice one over long term. But they do make a more traditional style, sort of v- RMV or VMR. Okay. Do you, did they ever mess around with it in Western Australia 
Have you ever come across yeah, McHenry? Yeah, McHenry Honan makes one. Oh, yeah, McHenry Honan. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Not much. A little bit though. Yeah, I've seen a couple of them. Yeah. It's a hard sell. Mm. It's a hard sell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anywhere in the world, it's a hard sell. So, might be an idea if we looked at the BBR Shiraz next to the SGM. So that's uh, jars three and four. Um, I've got to say, looking at um, oh, that same vintage, let me just check. Yeah. Oops. Same vintage. No, we're not. The Shiraz is 2019. And the uh, SGM is 17. Yeah, I've literally reordered today from Christy because we just got, as soon as we announced this tasting, everyone just lifted the bottles. Yeah, Lou, I was wondering if it was people who uh, couldn't make the tasting. There was definitely a, a uptick after the marketing went. Yeah. Christy, yeah, can you show us like... the labels? Because I've lost track of the different wrappings of your BBR series now. So that's the Shiraz that you got in your hand. That's no. a block red. That's a blend. The blend. Okay. Okay. That's okay. it. So the red one's a blend. And the Shiraz is this one. Okay. So it's got the white label. I'm still amazed by re the relative value of these wines coming off the, uh, the viticultural history of the vines. It just blows me away that we can all. Uh, make an urn and bring it to the customer's table at under $40. It's extraordinary value. It blows my mind too. <laughs> yeah. I don't like to talk about prices too much with wine producers in case they're going to increase the pricing on us. But have you guys found uh, additional burdens in terms of export markets and shipping in the last two years? Or is it something really that hasn't really impacted the growers per se? Uh, it's gone through the roof in the last six months. It's terrible. Um, yeah, it's starting to really impact. So uh, I don't, there no, doesn't seem to be any answer there. Yeah, well, let's not talk about it too much. I mean, we're still a fair way below $40 a bottle. Let's long may it last. <laughs> we're at 36 for both of these wines. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a reason for that, Robert. Um, in Australia, we have a very keen price point by glass, wine by the glass. Mm -hmm. And if you don't hit those, uh, price points you do not get on the list and that's where you get volume got it uh i'd love to sell them at 40 dollars a bottle but they just wouldn't move and you mm -hmm. can't because of, you always have these dual licensed premises so if you gave them pouring allowance to actually do it they yes. discount them through their bottle shops so you're shot in the foot every direction yeah. you can't win yeah got it it's not really comparing apples with apples though chris because by the time we get it up here you, you've paid ten bucks um, customs duties as well, then seven seven dollars GST on top. So, considering that you have to pay that excise on the way in, these wines just are tremendous value in this market. Yeah. They, so that's why I'm not I'm not surprised they do well. I think they just get forgotten from time to time, and then people realise, holy hell, that that really is a good deal. One question though, did you guys get messed around by the whole Chinese thing? Not really. We didn't sell a lot into China. Um, right. Though I did go to an industry presentation last Thursday week, and I don't see that there's going to be a lot of happy faces in the next 12 months. Well, you've got a big harvest. Well, go. You've got a big harvest coming on, and you know, mm. we're, seeing, we're seeing a lot of pressure out of McLaren in particular, some of the producers there, uh, for some reason, thinking that Singapore will be... Um, uh, a solution to their Chinese overflow, it's not going to happen. I mean, you know, this is five million people here. That's, that's well, it. it never was, was it, Lou? It's, <laughs> never, it's always been a finite market. Yeah, exactly. So I'm really surprised. You know, I've been, been getting shown some really good, really good prices of really good wines, and I, f I just feel heartbroken for the guys because they, they go, oh, can you take two containers? I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, that'll be enough for 10 years. I said, no, I, I can't. I guess population size, Singapore is probably the size of the average third tier Chinese city at 4 50. million people. Yeah, I mean, just... It's, it's really, really tight. In, in I don't even think it's a third tier city, Robert. I've been to some cities in China that, you know, are second, third tier cities, and they're sort of 12, 14 million. Yeah. It's yeah, just it's extraordinary. Um, and that market... I mean, there is nothing to replace it. And the Australian government keep coming up with ideas that we're going to go to India or we're going to find Taiwan or Korea. 
that's rubbish. It's just it's just not going to happen in the short term. But it shouldn't affect the premium regions. It it will flow through to the lesser, the more irrigated regions first. Um, they'll be the ones to tumble. And the ones that actually haven't got nine brands, there's a lot of winemakers that actually put all their eggs in the China basket. They don't have a domestic market at all. So they're the ones that we'll see sort of struggle with. Well, that's what I, I think a lot of people don't realise that, especially in Singapore, how many labels and wineries there are in Australia for whom we've never even heard of the wine, the wineries or, or whatever. They're, they're 100% export. Um, and as Clarendon Hills found out, you know, uh, almost 20 years ago now, if you don't have a core market at home and suddenly your export market dries up, you can find yourself in real trouble really quickly. So, I don't know, I, I hate to be a pessimist about it, but I think there's a lot of these no-name guys that are going to struggle. I, don't, I think there'll be vineyard pulled out and, it, yeah, there'll definitely be a price dive in some areas. Um, but companies like us, we should be, we're pretty robust. I think we'll be fine. We're only... Well, yeah. Premium Barossa, especially old vine stuff, you know, it, 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 it goes through cycles, but it... It, it maintains its its gravitas and its level throughout history, that's for sure. I think the other thing is you've got to have honesty. Um, people trust us in yeah. our brand. Um, we've been doing it for a long time. We don't ever shortchange people. So they do trust us. They know that they're going to get what they're buying each year. Yeah, yeah um, true. I think that's really important. For Australia as well, China has only been a big market fairly recently. You only have to sort of go back seven, eight years um, to when it wasn't big. And if you look back then, there's just a, there'll be a, a price, uh, a decrease in price of fruit, and then they'll come through at the end, end of, you know, to the bottle. And, but there's still a market for what we're growing here. So it's a, you don't have to go that far back in time to, to see what life was like before China. But you guys aren't mega production either, right? What's, what's your total? No. We're Turkey Flat so insulated from this because we're so domestically focused. Yep. So, and China's never been a big market. Um, UK is good for us, but really, we're a really strong domestic brand. It insulates you from so many things. As you're saying, Clarendon Hills was so hinged on America, and when that fell away, it hurt them. Yeah. But, but Great Turkey lines, right? But it didn't matter because they had no backbone to go back to. It was, it was a disaster for them. But I remember. And correct me if I'm wrong, because I remember when I first started drinking um, Australian wines at home, I mean, Turkey Flat Shiraz is always one of those staples. And I think in Langton's list now, it's one of the top five or something most collected. The Shiraz is in yeah. the... Uh, well, no, no. I was going to raise... The Shiraz is in the top 50 most collected wines at Wynock, which yeah. for oh, me is one of... It's one of the best attributes or uh, accolades a wine a wine could ever get because these are the people who are paying retail and storing and for me that's a barometer of uh, far far higher for me than a couple of wigs sitting somewhere in a tasting room saying this is the right you know this is the best wine for Australia it's people are actually putting their money down um, and so yeah it's it's a big it's a big accolade for me but before we get to the Shiraz I, I was hoping Mark you could just in just in a maybe a hundred words, give us the reasons as a own specialist. What is the Shiraz bringing to the blend? What is the Grenache bringing to the blend? What is the Mataro bringing to the blend? Because we're about to taste a hundred percent Mataro, which I'm racking my brains to think of anyone else who makes a hundred percent Mataro. I, I really, it's a few. There's a few oh, probably. Yeah. Okay, it shows how little exposure I've got to Australia these days. I, <laughs> I think there was Dean Hewitson, maybe. Yeah. And I think that's all I could remember from, from the old days anyway. Uh, yeah. So you maybe, know, yep. Dean, I was the first to hang his hat on it. Yeah, oh. that really, the really old patch that he's got. But, um, yeah. But back to the original question, I'd say Shiraz gives you mid palate and volume. Right. Uh, Grenache gives you aromatics uh, and... Um, a lightness on the palate um, and Mataro gives you an earthiness through the palate with a nice bit of grunt on the end of tanners. That's, that's a brilliant description because if people now taste that jar number five uh, and see the quality of the Mataro that's there, 
I think there's very few people who are able to produce a wine that's that finished in, in out of Australia, certainly, in that yeah. soul sort of... Slow down, that, mate. We're still doing stuff. number three and four. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> We've got to get there first. Talk, Mark, talk us through number number three. So the Shiraz... Versus... I'll be back in a second. Oh, God, he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> the, the pizza's arrived. Um, but, Mark, talk us through the, um, the Shiraz versus the GSM. They're um, obviously from the same shop. There's a there's a, a thread running through them that is of the same family. Yeah, look, uh, what I look for in these wines is for them to be bright, to be youthful. Um, I love aromatics. I love aromatics in wines. They, they always tell the most interesting stories, the aromatics. So I'm looking for a bit of that sort of whole bunchiness, a um, bit of savouriness through them too. Um, but really, they just need to be bright, refreshing examples from our region. You know, coming out of sort of, uh, of a few decades where everything had to be super rich and heavy, it, it didn't have to, it doesn't have to be. It can be really full of life. And so that's what I look for with these two wines. I'm trying to make a, a GSM that's reflective of the region that's super bright and super drinkable. I'm trying to make a, a Shiraz that's super bright and super drinkable. And they both are. They're, they're, yeah, they're, they're fresh, they're light on their feet. There's no heaviness to them at all. And they, they are very aromatic. Very pleasant, very pleasant. I mean, definitely the winemaking is, I hope we all focus on aromatics, uh, try and protect the wine as much as possible throughout the whole process, trying to deliver you something that really speaks out of glass. And that's why we go well in shows and why we do well with critics as well, because they smell it's, like Yeah, it's interesting. We had, um, a couple of weeks back, we had uh, Brett Grock Brett from, yeah. from uh, Eparosa, and he was speaking very kindly of your good self. And... That's what he was all about as well. Uh, he very much, you know, with his white Grenache, saying that he's a, a Rhone uh, aficionado. You know, Rhone is where his heart is, and that's what he's trying to do with with his um, Barossa, Mataro, and Shiraz. That bring the aromatics out um, first and foremost, and and secondly, you know, try and keep it light on its feet, fresh and and, and lively. Yeah. Well, if you think, I think because we have so much sun here, you can assume you're always going to have a baseline of good fruit no matter what you do to the wine. And you ripeness, know. right? It always might be ripe. Yeah. It's, there's no trick to it. Just yeah. leave it on the vine longer and you'll get that richness. So if you assume no matter what you do to the wine, it's going to have that baseline, then try to do everything you can to work other things into the wine and, and know that you'll be safe having a lot of fruit in there. And so by doing that, you start to reward the other characters that can be delivered from the vineyards. So you're going, okay, even if I pick this as 11 bow, mate, it's still going to have a lot of fruit. Not that we do that. What could, but what happens if I pick an 11 bow, mate? What happens if I 12? What if I use stem? What if I use whole bunch? Yep. What characters am I going to get into the wine? Again, assuming I'm going to have a really strong baseline of fruit. And that's when you start to get these really nice bright characters the wines become lighter on their feet and a whole lot more appealing with food and it and it, you know and getting through a bottle with friends. Uh, no, very easy, very easy, very approachable. The tannins are soft, round, polished, just easy. It's what Barossa should have done all the time, and then they went on that journey there for a while and just ex over extracted, right? And it just became heavy and cloying and jammy, unfortunately. But uh, that's what was earning people money. You can't blame them. Yeah, fair enough. Well, that was the Parkerism, Robert Parker. Yeah, it was. It, I mean, there's still there's still a group of people out there who still make that sort of style, and fair enough. I mean, every once in a while, I don't mind those big styles. I've got some old Ringland sitting back in my cellar, which uh, I can't drink every every uh, so often. But at a hundred, at a lazy hundred. Every every once, yeah, every once in a while though, they really are extraordinary pieces of work. You, you look at them, you go. You know, something's tipping the scales to eighteen percent or whatever, and yet with time they've actually become more balanced rather than unbalanced, and that's a miracle. Yeah. That, that they don't miracle. all do that. Uh, I, I no. was about to say it's uh, it's a small party of people of which Ringland is certainly one of them, where yeah. the wine seems to go through this characteristic, you know, muffin top exuberance. Uh, m many of them fall over it, whereas. Uh, much of the ring of Ringland's work seems to 
just finesse with time. They just get the sort of... They, they're a miracle, the, Rob. Some of them are really a miracle. Them. Whereas okay. there's been others, you know, I don't want to mention names, but they fall apart. And all you're left with is the fruit die, dies away and you're left with acid. And it's just, it's just an unbalanced yeah. reduction and it's just nasty. Nasty, nasty, nasty. Great when they were young as uh, show ponies, right? And, oh. and clocking up medals left, right, and centre because they would stand out in the lineup. Yeah. It's so, like uh, the big breasted bird in the, in the lineup of flat chested birds, right? She's going to get well, a chance. She'll always win. She's always going to win, right? <laughs> yeah. um, the trouble is, yeah, over, over time, gravity takes its toll and you may not be that interested in 10 years. But anyway, I digress. Diversity, <laughs> diversity is the key, though, isn't it? It's really? good to have all these styles out there, but the styles that we've got are, are much brighter and wider on their feet. And we yeah. find that the next generation, the younger generation, that's what they're looking for. Um, they don't what want the yummy, plummy wines. Plus, oh, they? it's what we like to drink. Mm. Yeah. You know, yeah. We're working with these wines all the time. We're taking them home. This is where this is where happiness is at. It's where yeah. you know you sit there and you go, "This is lovely with my milk." rather than going, I'm trying to force something too much out of this vineyard, you know? If this you is where me... happiness is at. Okay. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Lou, I'm going to get a T-shirt made for you. It says that. I can throw it on me when I'm being a grump in the yeah. wine. <laughs> <laughs> so how would you come... I mean, it's apples to apples. We're looking at a Mataro 20 here and a Shiraz 17. So, you know, the vintages are completely different from each other. Uh, maybe you can sketch that for us a little. Uh, well, Rob, as you stepped out, so we just finished with the, um, the GSM and the Shiraz. So yeah. now we're on to the Mataro. Mataro, okay. Mataro now, okay. So, uh, Mark, would you find align the Mataro with what what's coming out of Monastrell or... Do you take any sort of uh, any sort of inspiration from that corner of the world? Uh, not really. We've been compared to Good Bandol. You might have seen oh, Gary right. Walsh's review on the twenty. Uh, yeah. He loved that. Um, again, you know, you don't want to be mirroring these regions. You're just trying to find the strengths within your own vineyard and trying to push them up. Mm. Um, but it's nice when people say that because it means you've got a nice true reflection of the variety. I've got to say that. By far, I mean, the people in Monastrell are working really hard at elevating the sort of mean average of what they're producing. Um, but by and large, what's coming out of that part of the world is quite guttural and, and quite clumsy and rough. It doesn't have the sort of form and poise that you've managed to achieve uh, with yours. Uh, it, it, I, I'd love to pour this for a lot of Spaniards that I know and say, okay, where, where do you think it comes from? Because I don't think they'd be able to pick it. It's uh, it's a fantastic example of, of the varietal. I think it's uh, it's wonderful. Yeah, and so this is your eleventh year, right? That you've been making it. Uh, Two thousand and five. That was That's the first. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, Rob, it's a shame you don't have a glass in front of you. This is really singing tonight. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. It's in great form. The uh, twenty Matari you're talking about? No, yeah. this we've got the um, nineteen. I think. Not the twenty. 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 Yeah. And it's yeah. all sold out, Christy. <laughs> I can't reorder. What's going on? No, we didn't make much. Um, no, we, we essentially, it used to, it was quite different in style a while back. We used to leave it in oak a lot longer and bottle it, and it was far more savoury when it went to bottle. Mm -hmm. And I realised that to capture the sort of youthful essence of it, it needed to go to bottle a lot earlier. Um, and he didn't have a huge following, really. No. Um, but with the change of winemaking style that came with it, it's got a big following. So we're selling out really quickly now. It's the first to sell out. Of the no, this, this, is a, this is a great example. Not well, interestingly favorite. enough, our uh, distributor in Australia has dropped it out of their portfolio because they can't sell it. We said that's absolutely fine because we threw it direct through cellar door. It's not, it's not a drama at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, correct, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but Monastrel, um, Mataro, Mataro, is Mavedra the same? Yep. yep. Yeah, that's right. So in answer to the question this has been asked on the chat, correct. Yes, it is the same. Colin? 
And we did call it Maverd for quite a while, but yeah. there isn't an Australian that can walk into a room that can say Maverd. <laughs> I certainly can't spell it. <laughs> so it was, we dropped it, went back to Mataro, which seems ultimately sensible. So how much is, I mean, it's lovely. How much do you make? It's vintage dependent, really. That one's oh. 20, it's like 1,100 litres, so whatever that converts to. Really? Oh. Yeah. Well, we, we got a whole two bottles left, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, well. we got that one really strong review from Gary Walt. Like, yeah, there's quite a few people, but Gary Walt went hard on it early and it just disappeared. It just walked from that. So. That's the 21. Well, good. Yeah. Well, well, the 21 will be, we've probably got more volume of 21. When's that ready? Uh, we'll go to bottle in December. Okay, that doesn't right. help my order tomorrow, though, Christy. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good. That's what we mm -hmm. want. We, you know, we lo I loved it as a winemaker just to see a, a wine mm -hmm. walk like that uh, and people to be grasping for it. So mm -hmm. chuck your order in. It'll move again. Gary will love it again. <laughs> God, you and Rob will get along famously. <laughs> <laughs> he, he loves selling wine that he hasn't got. Yeah, it's my favourite thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, just, just just sell the ones that you've got, and we've got some pretty schmick news on the rosé. So, excellent what news. Come on, don't be shy. Well, we won a trophy at the Brossa Wine Show, oh, uh, which oh, is that's pretty, fantastic. That's, that's really great. exciting stuff. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Uh, and it's embargoed, but yeah, it's, pretty fair chance we won a trophy at Adelaide for it too. So it's pretty rare for a rosé to to clean two shows oh. up like that. Yeah. But uh, we haven't got the full news yet, so... But so if I put a note out saying uh, <laughs> best rosé in, in out of Barossa and there's a vicious but uh, unfounded rumour that it's a double trophy winner, am I able to say that? If you say it after about 2.30pm Australian Central Time tomorrow... <laughs> <laughs> Done! Sold! Sold! <laughs> and, uh, you'll be able to say that. But yeah. the, Rose you know, the, the other thing, Chrissy, that I'm going to annoy you with is that we've got no Grenache left and you're not selling me any. Uh, it's because we've got cold wines. <laughs> 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 Finally, they're walking. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> We're not Chinese, you know. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's first in best dress you've got to be in. Yeah, you've got to be in it to win it. Speaking of which, Lou's, Lou's got a question for both of you before we wrap up. But are there any no, other I haven't things? finished. No, we haven't had the Shiraz yet. The Shiraz yet. Oh, I thought you said you'd had it when I was in the loop. No, no. we had the other Shiraz. No, the other one. Oh, okay. All right, so we've got to do the, the bomb diggity now. The estate Shiraz. This is, is the one. This is the 17. Uh, Hewan and I've closed my book. I can't remember the other one was. That uh, Gary both gave it 95. Um, and this is the, I think this might have been the vintage that hit the wine arc top 20 most collected. I think it was the 17 that actually got it into that, uh, into that uh, stratosphere. Yeah, like I'm uh, talking briefly about it, uh, 17 was a cool wet vintage year, but it really suited how we grew, grow grapes. Mm -hmm. uh, we grow them hard and uh, herbicide free. Um, so we get concentration, we get concentration early. So I suited how we uh, we grow it. And for me, the estate Shiraz, um, you know, it's hard to get that balance and freshness every year, but in 17, it came in spades. And out of the 13 years, 12, 13 years I've been at Turkey Flat, the 17 estate is my favorite by far. And every time I look at it, I just think it's a beautifully sculpted version of Barossa Valley Shiraz. It's bright, it's bunchy, the oak sits in there really well. It gives it length. It speaks of the last 25 years of Australian Shiraz making, but it also speaks of the future. There's just a lovely softness to it. It's just my, yeah, it'll be the-, hey, the I, I, I think you've nailed it in the descriptor. I don't know if it's an adverb or an adjective, sculptured. For me, that's the thing that I always look for out of South Australian Shiraz, because most of it can't attain that. It seems to me that, the heat doesn't allow it to have that kind of beautiful angular architecture. Uh, and it's a, it's a really good way to, to describe what you've got going on there. 
uh, Turkey sets it apart from so many other Shiraz from these warmer areas. Yeah, and like I said, the, the vintage just played into how we grew and at the yeah. moment in time where the winemaking really matched what was coming out of the vineyard as well. It is just a lovely wine. It'll go a long time. Mate, when it's cold and wet, though, doesn't that play down the freshness normally in, a, in, a, in the final result? Yeah, uh, well, it really, it really depends. It depends how you grow your grapes. So okay. if you're growing with a lot of water and a lot of crop and you don't change that, you're not going to have a fresh final wine. But if, you, Got it. if you're growing in balance with your, your, the year and with your environment, you'll definitely have freshness with coolness. Yeah, yeah. And I think you've also seen the 17 Butchers blend tonight. I mean, that was that has been, and we made a lot in 17 because it was such a great vintage, but it's been a deliciously successful wine for us. I mean, just, just doesn't move. They're just looking great. Yeah. Mm. It's just, yeah, yeah. It was just a good vintage for how exactly how we grow and make wine. And while I was, while I was away, what was the, the blend between the Shiraz, Grenache and Mouvert in the Butchers? I'll tell you why you'd be testing me. Because the twenties already in bottle. Oh, yeah. probably <laughs> some mid sixties of Shiraz, and then the rest split between. So, the so Shiraz from National I, Tower. Right? I reckon it'll be 50, 35, 15, something, okay. something like that. So an SGM, mm. and then in eighteen we actually moved to a GSM. But the seventeen as a SGM suited it because it gave that mid that mid body richness, mm -hmm. which would have been a bit depleted in the season if it was Grenache based because yeah, of the cool thing. So it works in well. So, Christy, first of all, I want to tell you that the, the Shrez, the 17 is just looking marvellous. It really is. So it's coming along in leaps and bounds, but we'll move on to the 18, obviously, and I'll top up some more 18 with that order. But Colin is lamenting the I fact that the cabinet is <laughs> gone. All right, I think, I think I can... I'll chime in. So... so Back when I was in Japan about 15 years ago, so Turkey Flat was pretty reasonably popular with sort of some of the guys I knew. And um, I, I liked the Cabernet a lot. And when we visited uh, Turkey Flat a few years ago, we bought as many of the library vintages as I could. And they mentioned that it was a, a diseased, it was a bit of disease problem or something like that. And they, they were pulling it up, as Lou mentions. So I was just wondering, has there been a replanting or is there an idea to actually do some Cabernet again? Because uh, I, I, that was one of my favourites. Not at this stage. I mean, the Barossa really isn't suited, to, or Valley Floor's not suited to Cabernet. Um, and all the viticultural advice that we've been given is that we probably wouldn't replicate it. Uh, so we've just, we haven't planted it again. Uh, every now and again, I sort of get a rush of blood and think maybe we should, but I, I just don't think it's going to be right. Um, yeah, especially as climate... Remember specialists, remember. Yeah, exactly. I was just about to interject. <laughs> Don't mess with my pitch. <laughs> we actually did a tour oh, yeah. of the full Museum of Cabernet the other day. Oh, really? Uh, to see how they're looking. And there was yeah. a couple of really strong vintages. I think 02 and 06, especially 02, looked fantastic. Mm. Uh, but oh, just, oh. yeah, the, the, the um, cha climate change is happening. And yeah. there's less space for Cabernet and the Brosso. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I'll savor the few bottles I've got left. Yeah. Oh, more, than more than happy to share, Cole. Anytime. <laughs> just, uh, just name the gates in place. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> okay. Thanks, well, it looks like we've got all the questions out of the way. Uh, Lou, your traditional question of both yep. owner and winemaker. Yes, indeed. The one question we always ask of our guests is that when no one's looking and no one's taking notes, what do you guys like drinking that's not your own wine? Yeah, no. <laughs> no, um, if you're looking at the Brossa Valley... Uh, no, no, no. Your absolute favourite of what you would drink when the lights are out and Christy's not looking and the bankers aren't looking and Facebook is turned off and you're at home on your own naked. Jesus, do we have to have that as well? No, I just threw that in. I don't know. There's something wrong with me today. I'm sorry. But for, for me, it's a hard to answer with one, and this is a politically, it might sound politically correct, but I really drink to the seasons. So in autumn, I drink heaps of Pinot. As it goes into winter... Oh, that's cool. That's cool. As I, in winter, into, I drink a lot of Grenache into Nebbiolo. 
Um, as spring emerges, is, is now I drink a lot of rosé and chardonnay. When it gets really bloody hot here, I drink Sauvignon Blanc, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> barrel, barrel matured, barrel matured, makes yeah. it okay. And, and then when it hits vintage and I can't be stand grapes anymore, I just drink really yeah. neutral <laughs> European beers and then get back to autumn again. And when I fall in love with wine again, I go back to Pinot. Cool. And Pinot, Pinot from where in particular? Anywhere in particular? Well, I think in terms of value, it's hard to beat the New World. So you're looking at some better Mornington Peninsulas and uh, Mornington, yeah, Tassie. Tassie's coming along, but it's sort of more on that Burgundian, Burgundian dry red style. Yep. But I like the sort of panosity that comes from Mornington and yep. also uh, New Zealand. I mean, with New Zealand, you get it's quite intense, rich fruit through Otago yep. and stuff like that. But yep. some of the stuff out of Martin Brisbane, fantastic. Um, uh, Marlborough gets a bit dry ready, uh, but there's still good stuff there. But essentially, you know, if you go hunting with 40 to 50 bucks here, you're going to pick up something pretty good. And no. also, um, yeah, but then that, that merges very much with my Grenache drinking. And with Grenache drinking, then I'll, I'll look a bit to the old world as well because you still get really good value back in Australia. For sure, yeah. Yeah, Colin was just saying that um, Singapore, we don't really understand what seasons are. Yeah. <laughs> it's hot and wet every damn day yeah. for the next 10,000 years. Now, Christy, what about you? Not dissimilar to Mark. Um, we certainly oh. tend to go for more lighter style a lot of the time. Um, and I, I know that, uh, well, that's a pretty awful. It's, you know, the, we sort of fall back on butcher's block a lot. Um, as that's if you're going to fall back, it's a pretty good place to fall. I yeah. It's uh, it smells like gamo. I wish we could grow gamo in the Barossa Valley. Um, I think there'll Which, be a movement and a lot more planting of gamay. It's already happening, but I really? think, especially through the Adelaide Hills, you'll see because it's it's just it's one of those styles like Grenache that really suits what people call the Mediterranean food. <laughs> <style>. <laughs> That's it's interesting. A term. That's an interesting description. But mate, isn't gamay more aligned towards? A Pinot drinker than a Grenache drinker? I think it's the perfect. Think, it's a mix, isn't it? It's, it's the, the perfect, yeah. yeah. It's the middle. Okay. okay mm. that's so, yeah. And we, we um, as winemakers, probably, we, I love Riesling. Yeah. Of course. That's, yeah, no, it, it's, I, I don't think you're allowed to be a winemaker if you don't like Riesling. I think it's, exactly. It's on the application form somewhere. Yes. Everybody, everybody goes through it. <laughs> anyway, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I appreciate it's uh, getting fairly late in, in South Australia. Uh, thanks for being online. And uh, I hope to see you in the next 12 months or so online again. Once we've got well, some... we'd be lovely to come over and do a dinner. Yeah, it'd be fantastic. Uh, I know exactly where we do it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely somewhere that does duck and it's got some spice going on. There's a, there's a, lot, a couple of options that come to mind. We'll work yeah. it out. No, we all want to get out. I think we're all caged. Um, yeah. yeah, sick of it. Yeah, Not yeah well, one, one, one of the marvellous things about living in Singapore as an expat, of course, is that, apart from the tax rate, is that it's central to the world in terms of your travels. Right? Yeah, like, so Di and I have got daughters flung all over the planet now. Unfortunately, when you're not able to get out of the country, suddenly it's no longer quite as attractive as it used to be. So I think we've all had enough of this now. We need to move on. Mm. It's coming. It's coming. No, well, we're a bit the same. We've got kids in all sorts of places, non-pen, some in Singapore. Mm. Um, yeah, it's crazy. Mm. Yeah. Uh, on that very bit... upbeat note, thank you all for coming tonight. <laughs> yep. Yep. It's going to get better. It's going It'll to get, get better, better yeah. I promise. Yeah. Yeah, well, at least we haven't been Melbourne here. That's the 